Well, hi there, and thanks for joining in to learn about options for income. My name is Jason Ayers. I'm a derivatives market specialist by designation, director of business development at RN Croft Financial Group. I'm also a member of the Investment Review Committee at Croft, a member of the Board of Directors. I also serve as educational consultant for LearnToTradeGlobal.com and, of course, one of the educators for the TMX Montreal Exchange. As always, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, the information that we're going to be sharing here today is for educational purposes only. The options market, not unlike any uh, financial securities market, uh, does have its risks, and it's really important that you understand those risks before you actually go in and start trading these strategies for yourself. So as mentioned, today we're going to talk about what um, how, what you can do with options to generate income within your portfolio. Uh, we want to take a look at the covered call strategy, which is probably the most common strategy that's utilized by investors to generate cash flow in their investment portfolios. We're going to compare the difference between buy and hold versus the covered call strategy. We'll uh, give you an example so that you can uh, understand a little bit more effectively the mechanics of the strategy. We'll compare covered call writing versus put writing, which is also a very popular way that investors are using options to generate cash flow. We'll touch on the idea of using options or writing options using weekly uh, expiring contracts. And then we'll wrap things up, of course, with a, a bit of a quick overview. So how do you generate income using options? Well, the first approach, as I mentioned, is the covered call strategy. So before we get into that strategy, let's take a look at the um, the definition of being a call option buyer versus being a call option seller or writer. So remember that the call option buyer pays for the right to purchase the underlying security at a specific price over a specific period of time. Now the price or premium that the call option buyer pays goes to the call option seller or writer. Now that call option writer is getting paid to take on the obligation to sell the underlying security at a specific price within a specific period of time. So because we're looking at generating cash flow utilizing options and more specifically we're going to start with the covered call strategy or the covered call writing strategy, we're going to focus on being the call option seller in this case. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to get paid for taking on an obligation. Remember that one contract controls 100 shares of the underlying security, and that's an important consideration uh, when you are uh, the option writer and you're looking to generate cash flow, particularly when you're considering utilizing the covered call strategy. Because if you are selling a call option, you are obligating yourself to deliver 100 shares of the underlying security. So what makes this strategy a covered call strategy is the fact that you own the 100 shares or the number of shares that you are obligated to deliver through the sale of the uh, of the call option contracts. Remember that the price of the contract is listed in a per share format. Uh, and so what happens is because each contract represents 100 shares, there's a 100 unit multiplier. So for example, if we're looking at a quote of $1.25, we multiply that by 100 and the contract is $125. So we would be receiving, in the case of the call option writer, $125 per contract um, to take on the obligation of delivering 100 shares per contract of the underlying security at the specified price within the specified period of time. So what is covered call writing? Well, the first um, step is, is buying um, the um, underlying shares. So uh, in other words, we really want to make sure that we are confident and comfortable with the stock or the exchange traded fund that we are purchasing because that actually is a very important part of the covered call strategy. So we always want to focus first on being comfortable with the uh, underlying security that we are um, looking to purchase, or we may in fact already own the underlying shares and provided that those underlying shares or the, the company that we already own is options eligible, we can apply this strategy. We are going to get paid a premium upfront for assuming the obligation to deliver the shares at the agreed upon price, which of course is reflected in the option contract 
and over a specific period of time, which once again is reflected in the contract that we have chosen to sell. And we're going to talk about how we make those choices and, and what to consider over um, uh, within the next couple of slides. But remember, what we are doing when we implement the covered call strategy is we are owning the underlying shares and we are getting paid to sell them at a specific price in the future. So we first want to look at, well, why would somebody do this? And remember that, um, that most investors um, really adopt the buy and hold mentality. So the idea, of course, is that, you know, you like stock XYZ, you think it's going to be a great investment that's going to increase in value over the next few years. So you're going to go ahead and buy it and you're going to subsequently um, hold on to it. Now, the challenge with that mentality is you really have no idea how much money you're going to make. You don't know how long it's going to take for you to make money. If you start losing on the investment, then the question becomes, am I going to sell it at a loss or do I hold on to it and, and, and wait for it to come back? At the end of the day, as an investor, you hope that the investment is going to produce a return, but you really don't know. Now, the way that I look at the covered call strategy or the covered call portfolio is kind of similar to people that own income properties. Recognize that, you know, the first step in owning an income property is finding a good solid house in a good solid neighborhood where you expect that the um, real estate market is going to appreciate. But you don't just sit there and board up the windows and board up the doors and just wait for the real estate market to appreciate the home's value. What you do is you put tenants into those homes and while the real estate market is appreciating, you are generating cash flow off of renting those, uh, renting out the property. So this is kind of the philosophy behind the covered call strategy. You find a great stock in a great sector where you have an expectation that the underlying shares are going to appreciate in value, but on a month to month basis, you're going to want to generate cash flow off of that investment so that in good times, it's, it's a revenue stream. It's helping to reduce the average cost base of the position. And in bad times, what this strategy does is it really mitigates the, uh, the impact of, um, of, uh, of volatility within the market. Um, what happens from a, from a psychological perspective is when you're executing a covered call strategy, you actually know how much cash flow you're going to make within a certain period of time. So you know how much and how long it's going to take you to make that cash flow. You're really not overly concerned whether the stock goes up or down. So that's an important consideration because it's a little uh, different from what uh, your a typical you know, investment uh, mindset is. Really what the intention is, is you're just looking to consistently generate cash flow. Now, let's take a look here at sort of the uh, typical approach to investing versus option writing and, and the distribution of risk. So if we take a look at the left side and we uh, look at the um, uh, sort of, you know, risk profile of, uh, of the standard investor, there's really only two ways that the standard investment can generate uh, cash flow. Um, either the stock is up a little or the stock is up a lot. Now, of course, you can generate um cash flow through dividends, but for the most part, the only way that you're going to be profitable on that stock position is if the stock moves in some way. The trade-off, of course, is that if the stock stays the same, goes down a little or goes down a lot, you are not generating any return. So we look at that as a lost opportunity. When you implement the option writing strategy, you actually can be profitable under a number of different scenarios. So uh, you can be profitable if the stock is down a little, depending on how much premium, of course, you've, uh, you've collected. You can generate cash flow if the stock stays the same. You can generate cash flow if the stock is up a little. You can generate cash flow if the stock is up a lot. Now, of course, the challenge is if the stock is down a lot, you still assume the risk of the shareholder. But the difference is, and this is where the strategy really helps uh, offset volatility within a portfolio, is all the premium that you've collected while the shares were moving in your favor or really doing nothing helps to offset the damage associated with a significant drop in the underlying security. 
you still need to consider whether or not it's a good investment. Does it make sense to still be within that stock? So there's no question about that. But really what this strategy does is it helps mitigate the risk um, uh, and volatility in holding the shares when things get a little, when the market gets a little choppy. Now let's just look at a, a generic um, example here. So um, let's assume that uh, we're looking to, you know, it's, it's August and we're uh, looking to buy a thousand shares of XYZ. And um, those shares are trading at $12 per share, which means we're going to be putting out $12,000. We can turn around and with it being August, we can turn around and we can sell um, a 13 strike call option that is trading at 85 cents and that will obligate us to deliver the shares at $13 over the next seven months. But we are in fact collecting 85 cents per um, uh, 85 cents per contract. Now, this is an example of a bit of a longer term position, something that a more passive investor might consider. But if we sold 10 covered calls against the thousand shares that we bought, we're going to collect $850 in total for taking on the obligation to sell the 1,000 shares over the next seven months at $13. So that equates to about a 7.08% premium uh, cash flow in seven months. So think about that. Just from selling that option contract alone, we're bringing in about 7%. Now, recognize that there is somebody on the other side of that transaction that is going to be the call option buyer. The great thing about the, um, the markets, the stock market, the options market, is you have so many different traders and investors using uh, stock positions and using options positions to meet their own independent objectives. So Jackie here is the call buyer, maybe thinking that stock XYZ is going to go up um, significantly within the next seven months and wants to buy the call as a stock replacement strategy. Peter, on the other hand, as the option writer, is looking to generate cash flow, has perhaps bought the shares when they were down at eight bucks and thinks that he's done very well with the investment, looking to get a little more upside, but thinks that eh, let's protect a bit of downside by selling some options and generate some cash flow to sell it at uh, the $13 price uh, as, a, as an upside target. So again, two investors, Jackie with one mindset, Peter with another mindset, coming together to make a deal in the options market around uh, shares of XYZ. Now, once again, share price of XYZ at 12 bucks. We wrote a strike price of 13, collected a premium of $7 or 7.08%. Let's look at what happens if the stock goes up a lot. So let's say in seven months, the shares hit $18. Well, that's a heck of a run to the upside. Based on the upside of the shares, uh, share price, which is a dollar plus the premium, the option writer collects about 15.41%. Now, recognize that that is the most that that call option writer can generate off of that trade. So there, there is an important sacrifice, for lack of a better word, when you sell the call option. Now, there are ways that you can manage the position. You can roll up and out. So you can roll up to another strike price, out to another expiration date if you want to avoid getting assigned at the, the lower strike. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you give up the profit potential of the underlying shares above the strike price you've, you've written. So you can see if the stock is up a little within that seven months, so it hits 13, you're still making 15.41%. Now, where the interesting opportunity is, is if the stock stays the same. If the stock's sitting at 12 bucks, you're actually making 7.8% even if the stock goes down a little bit. So let's say the stock drops from uh, 12 bucks, which is, is what the price was at when you executed the, the covered call right, uh, drops from 12 to 11.50, you actually still make about 2.91%. So stock is down, but you've made uh, a little cash flow. Now let's say the stock drops a lot within that time frame. Well, of course, you still want to be uh, managing the position um, on a month to month, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, to make sure that you're still in the right investment. But if you're still holding the stock after seven months and the stock is down a bit, um, you do incur a loss. So if the stock drops from 11.50 to nine bucks, that's pretty significant. Um, you're going to be down about 17.91%, right? Now, depending upon 
how much option writing you've been doing against the, these these shares previous to this, um, your 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 net loss on the position may be less. But if you just started doing it with the shares were at 12 and you sold the 13 strike, you'd be down about 17.91 percent. Important consideration is is an investor that is just holding the stock would be down 25 percent, right? So you can see how you've offset or mitigated some of that downside risk by selling those option contracts and, and collecting that premium. So in good times, once again, cash flow, uh, you're locking in profit, uh, you know, you're, you're, um, you're generating um, a return off of the capital appreciation of the shares, but you're also generating cash flow off of the option writing. One of the ways that we'll typically use this strategy is if we've been holding stock, a stock for a period of time and we think that perhaps it's hitting a target, rather than just as, as most uh, portfolio managers might do, uh, just sell the stock um, right away, what we would do is we would look to generate some cash flow off of selling the shares. So in other words, we can make the profit uh, or the return on the capital appreci appreciation of the shares. But as I like to look at it, we can also get paid to take those profits by selling a call option and getting paid to sell those shares at a specific price. So let's look at some different scenarios uh, that we may want to consider at expiration. So the first consideration is if the option is in the money. So remember back from our options fundamentals uh, video, um, what, what an in the money option is, is when the share value of the underlying security is trading above, in the case of the call option, the strike price of the call. So what that means is that the call option writer is now obligated to deliver on the, um, on the contract. So that call option writer is now obligated to deliver the shares at the strike price um, that, they, uh, that they chose to write the option at. So scenario one, uh, uh, option is in the money you can uh, deliver the stock at the strike price. So remember, your mindset is, I'm okay with that. Even if the stock is a little higher, that's fine. That was my target. I got paid to sell the shares. And so what happens is the option is you're, you're assigned on the option contract to fulfill your obligations and you lock in your, uh, your profit on the option right, plus you lock in the difference between what you purchase those shares for and what you uh, ended up uh, selling them at based on the strike price. Now, let's look at in the money scenario too. As I mentioned earlier on, you may be in a situation where the, the stock is trading higher than the option contract that you've written, but you want to keep the position, so you don't want to get rid of it. Well, the great thing again about the options market trading independently from the stock market, you can manage that option contract independently. You can buy the contract back, so you'll give back your premium and perhaps a little bit more depending upon where the shares are trading at and then subsequently sell another contract at a higher strike price and perhaps a further out um, uh, uh, expiration date in order to stay with the position. So you'll bring some more premium back in, you'll give yourself more upside on the stock, you'll be able to continue to hold on to the position for an extended period of time. Now this strategy is, calling, is, is referred to as rolling, so sometimes we'll roll up which means we're just rolling up to another strike price before expiration. And sometimes we'll roll up and out, which means up to another higher strike price and out to another expiration date. But just remember that you have that choice before expiration to make that decision and execute this trade to stay with the investment. Don't ever feel that you're trapped. Now let's look at scenario number three which is the option is out of the money at expiration. Well, we all know what happens to an option that's out of the money on expiration. It expires worthless. Not good for the option buyer, but that is exactly what we want to see as the option writer because what that means is we sold the premium for, in this example, 85 cents. Um, we collected all that time value up front. The time has passed. The stock hasn't moved. The option has depreciated based on the, uh, the, the option theta, which of course uh, um, measures the, the, the impact of time depreciation. So that on the expiration Friday, uh, at the close of the market, if the stock is not above that strike price, options were zero, 
you keep the full premium, continue owning the stock, and subsequently can go ahead for the following month and write another contract or get out of the position in its entirety and, and find a new opportunity. So there's a number of different ways that you can manage through uh, the, um, the position depending upon what you're looking to, uh, what you're looking to accomplish. Now the big question, contract selection. How do I know whether I should choose an in the money, at the money, or out of the money option contract? Uh, or how do I know what strike price to choose? So first of all, let's take a look at uh, strike price selection. So if you sell an in the money option contract, that's where you're gonna get the highest premium. The time value is low, so there's a low lower return uh, based on the, the um, uh, process of expiration. Um, but what this does is it brings in more um, cash up front. Uh, so it lowers the break even point on the stock and is therefore more conservative. So where might you do this? Well, you know, you can do this as a uh, tax deferral strategy. So let's say you're doing this outside of a registered account. It's December. You're profitable. Um, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, sell your position because there may be some tax implications. You can go ahead and sell a deep in the money call option into January. That gives you um, a, a significant buffer uh, on, uh, on the shares. So if the shares go down in value while you're losing on the shares, the call option contract that you've sold will also go down in value, which means you are making that back on the depreciation of the call option that you sold short. So um, it's a great way to hedge without putting money out, which would be the typical way you would be hedging if you're buying a put option. It's a great way to hedge against uh, a significant market decline. Now, the at the money option is the where we're going to pick up the greatest time value. Uh, and so this is where we get the greatest cash flow. Now, again, this this means you as the investor need to take on a little bit of a different mindset. You got to step back and say, I don't care so much about my stock going up in value. I just want to use it as a as a way of generating cash flow. So when you sell an at the money call, you're going to get the most premium up front because that's where time value is at its most. Uh, but you're going to limit the upside potential. So the intention, once again, is I just want cash flow. So it's very important to recognize uh, just and be comfortable with the, um, you know, the, the logistics of the trade. Uh, a lot of investors will um, create what we call sleeves in their portfolio. So, um, you know, one sleeve may be uh, built for capital appreciation. You're buying stocks with the expectation you're going to go higher and you don't want to limit that. And then another component of the portfolio may be dedicated to uh, generating cash flow in which psychologically you've pre you prepared yourself to um, just, you know, perhaps have to give up the stock, but to just be generating that cash flow. Now, out of the money options, you're going to get a lower premium, but um, but you, you are leaving upside for the stock. So the lower premium, um, provides less cash flow, but it still provides cash flow. So very important consideration, but it leaves uh, upside for the stock. So somebody that wants to benefit from the capital appreciation of, uh, of the stocks they're buying, but still wants to generate a little bit of income uh, off of the, uh, off of the position can look at utilizing an out of the money option. The next uh, consideration, of course, is the expiration month selection. So the front month generates a higher annualized cash flow, but is more transactional. So you really want to be uh, considerate of, uh, of your commission structure. Um, front month options are uh, what we would refer to at, or, or what we when we say front month options, what we're referring to is the are the options that are expiring nearest term. Uh, so, you know, right now, if it is, um, you know, if, it, if it's May, we would consider June to be the front month options. But again, more transactional. Further out months provide greater upfront premium and are less transactional. So that's more in line with uh, our example uh, earlier on with the seven month contract. That approach would be somebody that's just saying, look, I just need to bring in cash flow. I need premium in my portfolio. I don't want to be overly busy. I want to check it every once in a while. Uh, and so you know where you're going to get out and uh, and you know how much premium you're collecting and you know you've got, in the case of the example, you know, seven months, uh, you know, for that position to be in play. 
you need to select the approach that meets your objective. So if you're an active trader, an active investor, maybe that uh, active approach uh, on a month to month basis or, uh, or as we'll touch on uh, the um, you know, weekly basis makes sense. If you're more passive, you want to go with a, uh, you know, with an expiration month selection that is further out, uh, you know, maybe two, three, four, five, six months out. Which strategy is dependent upon your objectives? Is it for short term trading? So again, a lot of times we'll look at, you know, opportunistically, we'll look at examples on the short term. Uh, our focus typically is when implied volatility, as we've touched on before, expands significantly because of some sort of short term anomaly in the markets. We want to take advantage of that. Sell a call option or sell a put option, as we'll touch on, uh, with the expectation that we will sell it as soon as implied volatility contracts. Um, maybe if we're buying the shares and we have a short term target, right? Um, getting paid to sell your shares at a target within uh, within that month if it happens to hit your target. Retirement income, retirement cash flow, uh, great solution to add cash flow um, in this you know in the in the current market environment. Cash flow is a challenge to come by if your expectation is that you're just going to be able to benefit from you know dividends and, and interest payments. You need a little something extra, and the strategy here, the covered call strategy, you can use in your RSP, you can use in your um, your RIF. Uh, or your uh, or your lift. What we're looking at doing is taking advantage of consistent compounding growth on a month to month, year to year basis as we're generating that cash flow. If we don't need it uh, uh, as a paycheck because we're retired, we can continue to put that cash flow back into buying more shares and selling more uh, contracts and, and subsequently compounding uh, our returns. The intention here is that we're looking at stock market style returns with less risk. Remember, the idea is that we're generating cash flow over and above the typical approach. In good months, that adds to our returns. In bad months, what that does is it mitigates the, uh, the volatility. And in fact, studies have shown that overlaying this strategy uh, does, in fact, uh, yield a greater return, but uh, with a what we would refer to as a higher sharp ratio, which means you're getting that return with less risk. And of course, that's what every investor is uh, is striving for. Some important considerations: uh, dividends. You also receive dividends uh, as a uh, as a shareholder, which is a great benefit. So not only are you collecting uh, a cash flow from the options writing, but you're also as the shareholder collecting uh, dividends um, on uh, on the ex dividend day. Um, the the risk, though, of course, is that uh, you could get assigned early if on the day uh, the stock goes ex dividend, if the time premium left in the option is less than the dividend. So what does that mean? If I could buy the op, if I could buy a call option for 20 cents and exercise my right to own the stock immediately, uh, you know, before ex dividend to be shareholder on record. Um, uh, for less than, let's say, the the 40 cent dividend that's being paid out, I may choose to do that if there's a financial benefit. So you as the covered call writer, if the stock is is at the money or if the options at the money on, um, you know, on ex dividend day, it may be that you are assigned early. Now, what does that mean? You still get to keep the premium. You still get the benefit of the uh, whatever the difference is between what you paid for the stock and the strike price. But you just don't get the uh, the dividend. But um, you can live to to trade again and invest again in, uh, another day if that uh, does happen. We also want to recognize the difference between cash flow versus returns. When we talk about cash flow, it's the total premium collected, right? So we're just focusing specifically on how much are we collecting in premium from the option writing strategy. Returns are going to reflect any changes in the um, stock, so capital gain or loss, plus the premium, plus the dividends, right? So what we're looking to do is we're looking to increase our cash flow so that we can enhance our returns. And of course, returns are going to vary depending upon uh, if we're in a primary bull market, bear market, sideways market. So uh, the type of market environment that we're in will ultimately be uh, deterministic of just what sort of returns we might be able to expect. Keep in mind that in a uh, an environment where 
we have um, uh, an a higher implied volatility. And that means we're collecting more premium for holding the shares that we would typically hold. So usually that is a a positive uh, a positive uh, thing for the for the option writer, the option writer. Now let's take a look at covered call. Uh, writing versus put writing. So a quick refresher here. Once again, remember that the put option buyer is paying a premium and securing the right to sell the underlying shares at a specific price for a specific period of time. So that premium goes to the put option writer who is taking on an obligation to buy those shares at that agreed upon price and within that agreed upon time frame. And so again, what we want to do here is we want to focus on being the put option writer. And our intention is that rather than holding the shares and selling a call and getting paid to sell the shares, we are, we are going to hold cash and we are going to sell a put and we are going to get paid to take on the obligation to buy the shares. And, you know, quite often we'll find ourselves in a situation where maybe we think shares are a little overvalued of the stock we want to own. So rather than just sitting back and waiting and waiting on a month to month basis for it to come back to a price that we're interested in, we can just sell call or sell, sorry, sell put options because we're comfortable owning the shares. And every month we just generate that cash flow waiting to get assigned to own the underlying shares. It brings in uh, a revenue stream uh, on, on cash rather than just sitting in cash. And what it also does is when we finally do buy the shares, it actually has served to lower the cost basis and therefore lower the, uh, the risk exposure associated with holding the position. So again, the great thing about the, uh, the, the markets in general is that you have two different investors with two different uh, considerations. Doug is the put buyer, may be bearish on the stock or may hold the stock and looking, is looking to purchase the put as a, an insurance policy where Amy, um, she's got a different outlook on the markets and subsequently uh, just simply wants to um, get paid to take on the obligation to own the shares. Uh, so two different investors coming together in the options market and striking a deal um, based on uh, uh, rights and obligations associated with, with, with uh, 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 buying and selling the underlying security. So put option writing, we don't own the shares, right? We are holding cash as collateral against owning the shares. We then subsequently get paid a premium up front for taking on the obligation to purchase the underlying shares, again, at a specific price and over a specific period of time. Now, the considerations here, very, very similar to that of the covered call writer. Um, how long are you looking to be in the position? Uh, what are you looking to accomplish? What is your outlook on the underlying shares? How transactional do you want to be? All of that is going to go into consideration for um, what uh, strike price and what, what your expiration date uh, you utilize to, uh, uh, to execute the trade. Uh, let's take a look at the, a comparison between the, the two strategies. So once again, we're going to look at XYZ at $12. And if we specifically focus on the covered call strategy right now, if we buy the shares at $12 and we pay $1,000, we're going to put up $12,000 to buy those 1,000 shares. If we sell uh, 10 three-month calls at the money, so at a $12 strike, we're going to collect 50 cents or $500. Well, the alternative to that strategy is that $12,000 could sit in cash, so we don't own the shares. We can sell 10 three month 12 strike put options and take on the obligation to own the shares at 12, collect 50 cents or $5. So for the covered call writer, you've put up the $12,000 and hold the shares. For the put option writer, your $12,000 sits in cash and you've just simply gotten paid to take on the obligation to own those shares and are generating a cash flow off of that. Now, let's say three months later, the shares are trading above $12. Well, the, um, cover, the call option that the covered call writer sold will be exercised. The shares will be sold at $12. There is a net profit of $0.50 cents per share or $500. So ultimately, um, the covered call writer has generated that return for taking on the obligation to sell the shares at $12. Conversely, the put writer or selling the put, uh, because the shares are now above $12, the put will 
uh, expire. The um, no shares are ever transacted and there is a net profit of 50 cents per share or $500. Now, on the other side of it, if three months later the shares are um, below the $12 strike, for the covered call writer, the call will expire worthless. Remember, the only way that that call would have a value is if the shares were trading above $12 uh, on expiration. Since that's not the case in this example, uh, the calls will expire profitably. Uh, the shares remain in the investor's account. There's a net 50 cents per share realized in cash flow, which ultimately adjusts your cost base down to $11.50, which is, of course, your purchase price of the shares at 12 minus the premium that you collected at 50 cents. Now, when you sell the put, the put will be exercised at 12. You are obligated to buy a thousand shares at $12. There is a net realized 50 cents in cash flow. You now own the shares at $11.50, which is your $12 purchase price less the 50 cent premium you've collected. So you can see that the risk reward profile for the covered call right and the put right is essentially the same thing. You, you have the same risks associated with selling the call as you do with selling the put. Now, just to touch a little bit on uh, generating income with weekly options, um, weekly options uh, uh, characteristically are the same as, as a standardized monthly contract. There is implied volatility influences, there is time depreciation, albeit, and here's the, the advantage, it's much quicker uh, within the last week of the um, within the last week of the um, uh, of the expiration cycle, um, but uh, all of the characteristics uh, apply. Really, the difference is that there are only eight trading days. So uh, a weekly option is introduced on a Thursday and then trades through to the close of the following uh, following Friday. Uh, so. What you are really looking to do is you're trying to leverage the very quick expiration process to generate cash flow on a weekly basis. Uh, so you're taking advantage of that rapid time appreciation. Uh, what you can do is you can manage more actively on your underlying position so you can adjust the written strike to, to accommodate fluctuation in share prices on a week to week basis. So, you know, you may be writing at the money. Uh, weeks one, two, and three, but then have an expectation that the shares are going to move higher uh, the following week, and you may then subsequently uh, sell those shares or sell those call options um, at the uh, at the higher strike, or subsequently make an adjustment to the put option rights that you are uh, uh, that you've been uh, doing on a weekly basis. Again, you need to take into consideration. Uh, the increased transaction cost. That is the, you know, the, again, uh, we always want to take that into consideration as an active investor. What what are we paying in commissions and make sure that the strategies that we're, uh, that we're implementing uh, are, you know, um, accommodate for that. Put writing with weeklies, as I've already touched uh, on same considerations as um, as weekly call writing. Uh, we're looking to enhance further our annualized cash flow. Um, we are able to adjust on the on, on a shorter term to stay with the trade, to stay with the stock, um, and and adjust for uh, market fluctuations more actively. But what we want to consider again: increased uh, transaction costs and the limitation of no stock upside. Now, the thing about put writing, uh, while covered call writing is permissible in a registered account, put writing is not permissible in a uh, in a registered account. Um, so just a couple of things to uh, consider as we uh, as we wrap things up for uh, with, with this uh, particular presentation. Um, investors can reduce volatility and be more consistent in their portfolios while earning income beyond traditional means such as dividends. Covered call writing is mistakenly stereotyped as risky, but in fact, it is a more conservative strategy because we're utilizing the options uh, writing strategy as a way to, to offset and mitigate volatility within, uh, within our portfolio. Covered call writing can be executed in uh, registered accounts, um, but put writing, unfortunately, is only available in a uh, margin account. So remember, lots of information available at the Montreal Exchange uh, site. Uh, we've got our blogs at optionmatters.ca. 
There's videos and webinars, there's trading guides and strategies, calculators uh, and uh, trading simulators, as well as a really cool little uh, market uh, opportunity screening um, software called Options Play that you can access through the site as well. So as always, thanks very much for taking the time to uh, join me uh, for this session on uh, generating income utilizing options, and I certainly look forward to presenting to you on the next topic. Bye for now.